that for, for prescription renewals. And you know, when you got to call it in, she says sometimes it takes up to two weeks. So like, you gotta be kidding me. Well, good morning. Welcome to the Boonesboro Bible Church here in Boonesboro, Maryland. My name is Ernie Best, and today is July 4th, yes. the year of our Lord, 2021. Let's open it in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Father, and we realize how precious it is for your word to come to us. And Lord, the older we get, the more we realize its value and the tr treasures that it holds for us. We thank you for its precepts, and clearly uh, it, it's, the purpose is will define our lives and give us direction. We thank you for those principles that it instills in us with wisdom. May we be even stronger in our faith. Lord, we're grateful that your word gives us light because there is an enormous amount of darkness in the world today. We want to live on the bright side of life, Lord. We, we want to enjoy what you have for us rather than just endure our circumstances. Father, we want to see the beauty of your purpose and how they all fit together in such a divinely designed plan that makes great sense to you and to us. And Father, we thank you for the way you speak to us through your word. Lord, and I just pray that we realize its relevance and appreciate how often your word addresses the needs that we have in our day-to-day -day lives. In clearly stated words, it talks about where we live and how we are to live and what life is all about. Lord, we desperately need your guidance. So we submit ourselves to you and we commit ourselves to reading and studying your word. And may we be faithful and disciplined in this commitment this morning, Father. We just pray that you'd open our hearts and minds, give us understanding as we study your word. We pray for all the sick. We pray for those who, who are in need. And we pray for healing. And we pray for the lost. And we pray it all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. We are still in the last section of our study on the uh, Acts of the Apostles. Section 3, the church to the end of the earth. And we're in chapter 22. Chapter 22 has 30 verses. And the theme of chapter 22 is Paul's defense before that mob in Jerusalem. And we break it down into three parts. The first part, part 1, the first 21 verses, where Paul does address this mob. He began to make that address in the last chapter, and he continues here in the first part of chapter 22. And then Paul mentions his Roman citizenship. And then finally, the Sanhedrin is divided. This chapter gives Paul's message to the mob. He recounts the, his encounter with Christ and his subsequent experience, which brought him to Jerusalem. Then Paul appeals to his Roman citizenship to deliver him from the awful uh, beating of a prisoner. Let's listen to Paul. Here is a great message of the Apostle Paul in his address to the mob in Jerusalem. Verse 1, he says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, and in addressing the Jewish mob, the apostle wisely used Aramaic rather than Greek. 
As soon as they heard their mother tongue, they were pleasantly surprised and their, their shouts subsided, at least for a moment. Continuing verse 3, he says, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you are all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. As also the high priest bears me witness and all the council of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. So Paul began with his roots as a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, uh, his education at the feet of the well-known Jewish teacher Gamaliel, and his instruction in Judaism. He then gave special emphasis to his zeal as a Jew. He persecuted the Christian faith filling the prisons with those who believed in Jesus. The high priest and Sanhedrin could, uh, could bear witness to the, the thoughtfulness of his method. It was from them that he received letters authorizing him to go to Damascus and bring back Christians from there to Jerusalem to be punished. Verse 6, now it happened. As I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am, to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Up to this point in Paul's message, the Jews could understand perfectly. And if they were honest, they would have to agree that what had been said was true. Now the apostle is going to tell him of an event which changed the entire direction of his life forever. It'll be up to them to decide whether this event was of God. As Paul journeyed to Damascus, a great light from heaven shone all around him. The fact that it happened about noon, he recorded for the first time, indicates that the light was more brilliant and more glorious than the sun at its height. Struck to the ground by the intensity of the light, the persecutor heard a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Upon inquiry, he learned that it was Jesus of Nazareth who was speaking, speaking to him from heaven. The Nazarene had risen from the dead and was glorified. Verse 9, and those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. The men who traveled with him saw the light, and they heard the sound of the voice, Acts 9-7, but they did not hear the actual words that were spoken. In other words, they were conscious of noise, but not of the articulated speech that was coming. Verse 10, so I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise, go into Damascus. There you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see the glory of the light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Having had the private audience with the Lord of life and glory, Paul made a complete commitment of his spirit soul and body to the Savior. This is indicated by his question, what shall I do, Lord? The Lord Jesus directed him to go into Damascus, and there he would receive his instructions. Blinded by the light of Christ's glory, he was led by the hand into the city. Verse 12, then a certain Ananias a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. So in Damascus, he was visited by this Ananias, 
Paul describes him to his Jewish audience as a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. The testimony of such a man was important in collaborating the account of Paul's conversion. Verse 13, came to me and he stood and said, Brother, Saul, receive your sight. And at the same hour, I looked up at him. So according, uh, addressing Paul as Brother Saul, Ananias commanded him to receive his sight. It was then that Paul first looked up at him. Verse 14, then he said, the God of our father has chosen you that you should know that that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In verses 14 through 16, we learn for the first time that Ananias said to Paul, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. Several points of interest I think of importance should be noted in these verses. First, Ananias stated that it was the God of our fathers who had ordered the events on the road to Damascus. If the Jews were to oppose and resist what had happened, they were really fighting against God. Second, Ananias told Paul that he would be a witness for the Lord to all men. This should have prepared the Jewish crowd for Paul's announcement that he had been sent to the Gentiles. And third and finally, Paul was told to arise, be baptized, and wash away his sins. Verse 16 has been, I think, misused to teach uh, baptismal regeneration. It is possible that the verse only applies to Paul as a Jew who needed to disassociate himself from his Christ-rejecting nation by water baptism. A simpler solution based on the grammatical construction of the original is, is as follows. Unlike the King James Version, which punctuates as if there were four items in a row on the same level, the New King James, following the original, pairs the two first two items and the second two items. In the Greek, there is a definite verb modified by a... a uh, makes it practical in each half of the verse. A literal rendering would be having arisen, be baptized, and have your sins washed away by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. This last clause is supported by the general biblical teaching of Joel 2.32, Acts 2.21, and Romans 10.13. In verse 17 it says, Now it happened, that when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I, I imprisoned and, and, and beat those who, were, who believed on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Now, for the first time, we learn of an experience Paul had toward those to the close of the first visit to Jerusalem after his conversion. While he was praying in the temple, he fell into a trance and heard the Lord commanding him to get out of Jerusalem quickly because the Lord would not receive his testimony concerning Christ. The people would not receive his testimony concerning Christ. It seemed incredible to the apostle that his own people would refuse to listen to him. After all, they knew what a, what a zealous Jew he had been. Now he had, imp had imprisoned and beaten the disciples of Jesus 
and how he had even been a accomplice in the murder of Stephen. But the Lord repeated his command, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Now we move to section 2 in your outline, Paul's Roman citizenship, verses 22 to 29. Verse 22, And they listened to him until the words, And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air. So at this point, the Jews had been listening to Paul quietly. But his mention of going to the Gentiles with the gospel aroused insane jealousy and hatred. Hatred, Chanting furiously in wild disorder, they cried out for Paul's life. Verse 24, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they uh, shouted so against him. <clears throat> and as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, it is awful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned. When the commander saw them in their mad frenzy, he concluded that Paul must have been guilty of some very serious crime. Apparently, he could not understand Paul's message since it was given in Aramaic. So he determined to extract a confession from the apostle by torturing him. He therefore ordered his prisoner to be brought into the barracks and bound with thongs and ordered to be scourged. As these preparations for the scourging were moving ahead deliberately, Paul quietly asked the centurion if it was legal to scourge a Roman citizen when he was uncondemned. As a matter of fact, it was unlawful even to tie up a Roman citizen before his guilt had been proven. To scourge him was a very serious offense. Verse 26, when the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. The satyrian quickly went and told the commander to take care what he did to Paul because he was actually a Roman citizen. Verse 27, then the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. The commander answered with a large sum, I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. This brought the commander to Paul in a hurry. On inquiry, he learned that the apostle was indeed a Roman citizen. And there were three ways to become a Roman citizen in those days. First, citizenship was sometimes granted by imperial decree as a reward for service rendered. Secondly, it was possible to become a Roman <clears throat> by birth. This was the case with Paul. He was born in Tarsus. <clears throat> a free city of the Roman Empire, and his father was a Roman citizen. And finally, it was possible to purchase citizenship, often at a very high price. Thus, the commander had obtained his citizenship by paying a large sum. Verse 29 says, Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Disclosure of Paul's Roman citizenship canceled all the plans to scourge him and caused fear among the authorities. Section 3 in your outline, the Sanhedrin is divided over this whole thing. The commander was obviously anxious to know for certain why Paul had been arrested, accused by the Jews. At the same time, he was determined to carry out the proceedings in a very legal and orderly manner. Therefore, on the day after the mob scene in Jerusalem, he had Paul taken out of the prison and brought before the chief priest and the Sanhedrin. The captain finds that he was a remarkable man. He is a learned man who speaks Greek. He is not a common crook by any means. He is a Jew, but he's also a Roman citizen. The captain says, I am not going to treat Paul like a common criminal. 
will have a hearing to find out what the charges are against him. So the captain arranged a hearing before the chief priest and all, the entire council. Notice that Paul had many uh, assets which made him suitable to be a missionary to the Roman Empire. He had a worldview. He had Greek training, had prepared him as a uh, cosmic Christian. He was trained in the Mosaic system, which prepared him to interpret into the light of the coming of Christ and his redemptive death and resurrection. Not the least of his assets was his Roman citizenship, which finally opened the door for him to come into Rome. Takeaways from chapter 22. Of course, this is Paul's defense before the, the mob there in Jerusalem. And we broke it down into three sections and we heard his address to the mob. And then we heard all the uproar over uh, when they found out he was a Roman citizen. And then finally, we saw the division within the Sanhedrin themselves. So if you have committed your life to Jesus Christ, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of life are we living? The Christian life is supposed to be a life lived by faith. It is by faith that we entered into the Christian life, and it is by faith that we live it out each day. When we begin the Christian life by coming to Christ for forgiveness of sin, we understand that what we seek cannot be obtained by any other means than faith. We cannot work our way to heaven because nothing we could ever do would be sufficient. Those who believe that they can attain eternal life by keeping rules and regulations, a list of do's and don'ts, deny what the Bible clearly teaches. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is very clear. Because the just shall live by faith, Galatians 3.11. The Pharisees of Jesus' day rejected Christ because he told them this very truth. That all their righteous deeds were worthless. And that only faith in their Messiah would save them. In Romans 1, Paul says that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power that saves us. The gospel being the good news that all who believe in him will have eternal life. When we enter into the Christian life by faith in this good news, we see our faith grow as we become more and more about the things of God, who, the things of God who saved us. The gospel of Christ actually reveals God to us as we grow closer and closer to him each day. Romans 1.17 1, uh, says, For in the gospel of righteousness from God is revealed in a, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So the part of the Christian life is diligent reading and studying of God's word, accompanied by prayer for the understanding and wisdom for that closer more intimate relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. The Christian life is also supposed to be one of death to self in order to live a life by faith. Paul told the Galatians in chapter 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Being crucified with Christ means that we consider our old nature as been having nailed to the cross and we choose to live in a new nature, which is Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. He who loved us and died for us now lives in us and the life we live is by faith in him. Living the Christian life means sacrificing our own desires our own ambitions and glories and replacing them with those of Christ. And we can only do this by the power, by his power through faith that he gives us by his grace. The part of the Christian life is praying to that end. The Christian life is also supposed to be 
preserved to the very end. Hebrews 10, 38 and 39 addresses this issue by quoting from the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. God is not pleased with one who draws back from him after making a commitment, but those who live by faith will never draw back because they are kept by the Holy Spirit who assures us that we will continue with Christ till the end. Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14. The writer of Hebrews goes on to verify this truth in chapter 10 verse 39 when he said, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe in the saving of the soul. The true believer is one who believes to the very end. So the Christian life is once lived by faith in the God who saved us, the God who empowers us, the God who seals us for heaven and by whose power we are kept forever. The day-to-day -day life of faith is one that grows and strengthens as we seek God in his word through prayer, as we unite with other Christians whose goal of christ -like us is similar to our own. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this day, Father. We pray that your word has touched hearts this morning, Father. And we pray that through your Holy Spirit, they are drawn to you, Father. And Lord, we just pray that they will repent and turn away from their sin and in faith turn to you as their Lord and Savior. And Father, we give you glory and we give you honor and we thank you for this day and we, we just pray that you will be with us and guide us and direct us in all things. And we pray it in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Next week, verse, uh, chapter 23, 35 verses. And this is Paul's defense before the Sanhedrin. It, he continues. In the first 10 verses, the Sen, as we saw in the last uh, chapter, the Sanhedrin is most definitely divided. And then in verses 11 through 22, there's a plot developed against Paul. And then thirdly, Paul is sent to Felix in the last uh, few verses. So thank you for tuning in today and, and, and just uh, remember to tune in at 1030 this morning as Pastor Allen brings the morning message. And Pastor Allen is still in the book of Luke chapter 6 verses 27 through 36 and the subject of his message this morning is forgiveness and continue to read your read God's word and commit it to your heart Lord and and if you know the Lord is your is your Savior tell somebody else about the Lord Jesus this week somebody you come in contact with friends family neighbors strangers because that's what our function is as a believing Christian, as a, as a one who has committed his life to Christ. We are committed to preaching the gospel. And we just uh, would, uh, I would pray for, e for each and every one of you that the Lord will give you strength, will give you courage in this undertaking. So thanks for tuning in and don't forget to tune in at 1030 uh, Pastor Allen for the morning message